So what I want to do today is walk you through how you develop therapies for disorders, right? So this just the process of testing these things and getting them to the point where we know whether they're safe and whether they're effective in particular disorders. So some of this is going to be technical, but I'm going to try to take you through some terms because you'll hear about these as you hear various therapies being developed. What stage are they? And, and what are the questions being asked of um, a drug at a particular stage? And these are very important. Um, you know, and, and in some cases, this process will frustrate you because you'll think it should go much more quickly. And, um, and, and some parts of this are really to ensure that you've got the safety of patients in mind and that we have to really progress through a series of steps. And we try to go as quickly as possible to get an answer, but sometimes it's not as quickly as, as I think you'd hope. So let's go through the process about how we develop drugs in disorders. If I can advance the slides. There we go. So what I'm going to do is I'll talk to you about the stages of therapy or drug development, uh, why it's hard, why it usually fails, and why just a bit of a sobering aspect to this is we've got a long road ahead of us. We're committed to it, but uh, it takes a lot of time. Um, but I do think that the future is bright for uh, effective and safe therapies. And we're committed to, to going down that road. And then specifically, I'll end with what we're doing. Just a touch about our program in myotonic dystrophy. I'm not going to give you any details on that, because um, it's, it's, it's early times. So let's talk about some terms. And I'll try to um, uh, say what they are. I don't want to go into technical jargon, but there is a permission slip that you need to conduct any trial in humans called the Investigational New Drug Application. You have to submit it to the FDA, and basically it allows you to go into human testing. So that's the IND. It follows often many years of basic science research about what that drug might be doing in models of that human disease. Now, drug development takes a, a long time. So this is a complicated diagram, but I want you to take a look at that funnel that goes from left to right. Uh, and what you see is that researchers, often in academic institutions or in drug companies, may think, may, may look at five to 10,000 compounds for a particular disorder to get only one that ultimately is approved. And so that winnowing down of these compounds occurs because Maybe they don't work in humans as well, or maybe, maybe they have some toxicity or issues that, that say you can't use them the way that you had hoped to use them. So there is a tough process, but the goal of that process is to make sure that the ones that do get through to the end are both safe and effective. Now, if you look at the bottom of this graph, you also get a sense for how long does it take in the various aspects of drug development. So the drug discovery in preclinical, that's the, that's the animal models, that's the, the cell culture work, that's developing the compound. You can see that that takes three to six years. Luckily, we're kind of nearing the end of that, at, at least for one, one drug in myotonic dystrophy, and we'll be entering now into the, the clinical phase. But even that can take six to seven years before you ultimately get approval by the FDA to um, have that drug out there and available to the community. So what is the preclinical phase, or before you actually get into clinical trials? That's the part that can last up to six years. Well, you really need to make sure before you ever uh, give this drug into humans that you've looked at whether or not there is toxicity or damage that can be caused by the drug itself. So many of those drugs just don't get any further than that for that very reason. We look at the pharmacokinetics. That is. When the drug is given in an animal, where does it go? How long does it stay there? Does it get to the muscle, for example, in myotonic dystrophy? Does it get to the heart? Because we think that that's relevant in myotonic dystrophy. Does it get to other tissues that you would want that drug to be active in? To characterize beneficial pharmacodynamic 
effects. You've probably not heard of that word, but that just means does the drug do anything in the tissue that you want it to? So we know, we think, you heard from Tom Cooper, you'll hear from Charles tomorrow about what causes myotonic dystrophy and the effects. Well, we want to look in animals as to does this drug in animals do what we want it to do. That's called pharmacodynamics. And then ultimately we have to figure out how would we use it in humans. What's the dose? How frequently do we have to give it? What's the formulation of the drug? So all of that preclinical phase is to really guide the safe use in humans in early testing. That then gets you to your IND uh, and then you can start clinical testing. Now, there are a lot of people who are very interested and engaged in this process. You're seeing two triangles here. And basically this is how do you get a drug approved? Who funds this, right? So if you look at the left triangle, this yellow-orange triangle, it says, you know, in the very early phases, it's mainly academic researchers, right? So the NIH funds 31.2 billion dollars for basic research and translational research, which is how you bridge into a clinical development program. That's the main source of, of the initial research. In fact, most of the myotonic dystrophy research that has been done has come out of these extraordinary academic researchers who have forged this new path for myotonic dystrophy. But as you get later on in the blue triangle, now you're talking about the actual clinical development, clinical testing. So that's where it says here the private sector. This is clinical research, which can be funded by the NIH, but often is biotechnology companies or drug companies who take it on. And it's much more expensive usually than the initial phases. So here's the IND. This is the permission slip to go into human clinical testing. Outside the U.S., there are different names called a clinical trial application. It's the same thing. It's a permission slip that says, you know, you've done your preclinical work. You've got evidence that it seems to be safe. You've got evidence that you know how to use it. It's time to go into human clinical testing. And that's what the FDA looks at in order to give you your permission. They look at primarily safety. So just because a drug is going into human testing doesn't mean that it's likely to be successful. It may be, but that's really what the FDA wants to do is to make sure that you're not going to put patients in harm's way and that you're, you're, you're un, there's no undue risk to patients. I should tell you that in any clinical trial there are risks. Right? So there are, there, we may know about this drug in animals, but there are risks. And this is an experiment, it's not a therapy. So when you are asked to participate in these clinical trials, you need to know that we don't know if the drug works. And we may think it's safe, but we don't really know. And so you have to take that into account. So the phase one clinical goals. So these are the phase one studies that will start, for example, in myotonic dystrophy uh, in the near future. Those are not to look at whether the drug is effective. It's really just safety. It often is in healthy volunteers, although in some cases uh, it will be in a patient population such as in myotonic dystrophy. But, uh, but the people who go into these studies, you're not looking for a therapeutic effect. You're not looking to make them better. You're looking to understand the drug, its safety, where does it go? Now, phase two clinical trials are also called proof of concept trials, and that's where you typically are involved with patients, but they're fairly small studies, and they're often narrowly defined so that not all patients with myotonic dystrophy, for example, can get in, but only if you meet certain criteria. Now, this is probably very frustrating to the community because you may say, well, I want in. I want into that trial. And although that's true, uh, really what you have to do in the drug development process is try to figure out in the right population if the drug is having an effect. And if it is, you can expand out that population. But what you don't want to do is do the wrong population in that phase two clinical trial because then the program is gone. If you don't show that you have some effect of the drug in the disease in phase two studies, 
the program will not go any further and you haven't served the community well. So, so it may be frustrating, but you've got to take a fairly narrowly defined patient population often in these phase two studies. The goal is to provide some proof, some level of evidence that it's doing what you think it should be doing. And we can further define, well, what dose do we need and what patients are most likely to be responsive? So that's the phase two study. Again, those studies can take probably two to two and a half years, just those phase two studies alone. Seem to be, there we go. So then you go to the phase three study, and this is also called a pivotal study. This is the phase of clinical investigation that is required for approval. So the goal of the phase three study is to show that the drug actually is effective and safe. It usually has to involve a placebo group as well, which I know is uncomfortable. Um, it's uncomfortable for us as well, and we certainly try to minimize uh, the use of placebo. But what we have to show undeniably to the regulators like the FDA is that there is very clear evidence that this drug is doing what we think it's doing and it's improving the lives and function of patients with myotonic dystrophy. So we need statistical significance. We have their larger studies. There are often parallel groups. One group may get uh, placebo. Sometimes in some diseases you're comparing to a a standard therapy if there's one out there. There's not for myotonic dystrophy, but for other diseases you compare against that therapy. So now another term. Let's say you've gone through all of that successfully. So you've navigated through the preclinical phase, you've submitted your IND, and you've gone through the phase one, the phase two, and the phase three studies, and now you have unequivocal evidence that the drug is both safe and effective, you apply for approval. This is the NDA, the new drug application. Um, that is the red box that is squared uh, in the middle. That comes after the phase three study. And if the FDA in the US, or what's called the EMA in Europe, agrees with you that the drug is safe, and effective, then it will grant you approval to make this widely available to patients. So only after that phase is this no longer clinical research, because even the phase three study is a clinical research experiment we still don't know. But once we're granted the NDA, it is now a therapy that is available to the community. Now the FDA even then might say it is safe, it is effective, it is available then to the community, but they still may limit patients who could get it. They may say that, you know, uh, a certain subset of this population has not been shown um, to, to be responsive to this therapy and they may, may limit it. So what then happens is it's approved for a certain subset, hopefully the whole group of a particular disease, but, but maybe not, it depends on what the data says. Then what happens is what's called phase four studies. Now the drug is out there, but you want to look at it in more patients with, say, a broader age range or other populations. So here is the new drug application. If a new drug application leads to approval, this means that the FDA has permitted this company to make the therapy available. And there's a series of things that you can see on this slide that the FDA has considered. Is it safe and effective? Do its benefits outweigh its risks? Because again, every therapy has some risks. Um, but maybe the benefits outweigh the risks. And certainly if there's a drug that improves function and strength in myotonic dystrophy, one would hope that those benefits would outweigh the risks. But it depends upon the safety profile of the drug. They also want to make sure that how the drug is actually manufactured is safe and it is what we say it is. So they, they, they very rigorously look at the plants that are manufacturing the drug and the vials to make sure that it's safe. And the FDA actually does a very good job of 
uh, safeguarding the, the safety of individuals. They also are very interested in rare diseases such as myotonic dystrophy, and they work very hard with academic researchers and drug companies to get this therapy approved if it is indeed safe and effective. So we, we, we view them as, as a very good partner for us in drug development to get uh, our drugs out to the, to the community. They do say that no drug can be marketed in the United States until substantial evidence of its quality, safety, and effectiveness has been provided to the FDA's satisfaction. Now, what exactly substantial means is a little variable. But, um, you know, it's probably quite different in something for which there is, you know, two or three therapies already out there, as opposed to um, a, a disease for which there is no accepted therapy. And, and the FDA is very flexible in, in that. But even after it is approved, it is available, there still are phase four studies which are looking for new diseases or patient populations. For example, maybe children were not included in the initial studies. Maybe they were, but if they weren't, you would want to now go and look at the drug and make sure it's safe in pediatrics or, for example, pregnant women. How about comparing to other approved drugs or standard of care? Um, and there's something called pharmacovigilance, which means, you know, the, the studies that led to the approval of this drug may involve, say, a couple hundred patients. But once it's out there for the community, you may find something in, in terms of safety that you did not see in the clinical trials. So it's very important to continue to look, and this is where registries are very important, where we can hear from, from you about any potential safety issues that you're seeing and can respond to that and look into that. That's what phase four studies are. Okay, so that, those are the phases of drug development. I do want to tell you some sobering facts about therapy development, um, and then, then I'm going to tell you why I, I think the future is bright. So cost, cost for developing a new drug, really high. This is a bar chart that t shows you the cost of developing one new therapy from 1979 through 2005. You can just look at the right bar graph that number is, I think, $1.3 billion for one drug to get to market. So it has become increasingly expensive. And the probability of success is actually quite low. It depends upon the type of disorder. But I'll draw your attention to the one that says CNS, that's central nervous system. Those are neurologic or neuromuscular disorders. The success rate is there around 15%. So many of those that enter into clinical development won't be found to be safe and effective. It doesn't mean that, that the whole program is done, but it means you have to keep going at it time and time again until you, you get it right. And most drugs, actually, after they are approved, don't make a whole lot of money, and they don't actually recoup their investment. Now, that may sound like that's not particularly important to you, but what you want is you want lots of companies coming into myotonic dystrophy. You want lots of companies to see this as a way to really influence patients in disease. And so you want actually more successes and for companies to at least recoup their costs over time. And so there are ways that, that, that um, you're getting around that, but, but it's been a tough climate. And to be honest with you, many drug companies have left this space. They've left neuromuscular disorders. They've left neurodegenerative disorders. And many have left the orphan disease space. So myotonic dystrophy is an orphan disorder. Um, there's not a, a huge number of patients, certainly less than, say, Alzheimer's disease. And many companies have left that space. I will tell you that Biogenidec, we have not left that space. In fact, that is all that we want to do, is to be in this space with diseases like myotonic dystrophy. So there may be some failures along the way, but we're in it for the long haul, uh, and we're going to keep working to get it right. So I'll skip a couple of these slides, 
and give a little bit of an optimistic view. So regulators, including the FDA, have put in place a series of things to incentivize academic researchers and clinicians and drug companies to go into the orphan drug space, those types of disorders with relatively few patients. And so they make it easier to gain approvals in some case. Um, they reduce fees to the investigators um, to actually get the drug tested in clinical trials. And, and that's working. So as a result, what you're looking at is a bar graph showing the approvals for rare diseases. And they're going up substantially. Uh, and that's a good sign. So we're encouraged by that. And, and hopefully more companies will come back into that space. Certainly the, the science is really what has driven in myotonic dystrophy a lot of this interest. So you've heard from Tom Cooper, you'll hear, hear from Charles. These are the real pioneers in this space. I mean, they have done really beautiful scientific work to show what we think is the cause of myotonic dystrophy. That science is so beautiful that has really stimulated companies like Biogen IDEC and like ISIS to develop therapies that will now go into clinical testing. So the future is bright because we understand those sobering aspects. We understand this the time and the money and why there has been such a high failure rate. And what we're very committed to doing is to um, developing therapies in a smarter way. So we're understanding disease mechanisms more fully. Myotonic dystrophy is a very good example of that, where we think we understand key aspects of the disease. There are key aspects of the disease that we don't understand. Um, but we understand a lot, and um, so that helps. The, the antisense oligonucleotides, you heard about this earlier and you're, you'll hear about it tomorrow. These are very specific drugs. So one of the problems with any drug, say any pill that you take, is it affects not only what you want it to affect, but it affects other things as well. And that's what in many cases causes the safety problems. Well, antisense oligonucleotides are very, very specific. Tom said this earlier. So that gives them potentially a safety advantage that allows us to give something that is really affecting only what we want it to affect. And we're certainly hopeful that that's the case. So we're also using biomarkers. So that's a term that may, some of you may have heard. What we want to know early on in a drug development program is is it doing what we want it to do? Rather than subjecting patients to years and years of trials in which we don't know, only to find out potentially at the end that it didn't work, wouldn't it be great if we could find out early in drug development that maybe it's not working? Now that doesn't sound like a very optimistic slant on this, but if you find out early, we're not going to subject you to therapies that, that aren't doing what we want, and we can cancel that and move on to one that we think will work. So part of the problem is that in these diseases that we've studied, you don't know for years and years and years, and you put a lot of money into the program, and most importantly, you're subjecting patients to therapies which may not be effective. So what we're doing very importantly is to understand early if it's doing what we want. That's what a biomarker does for you. Something from the blood, something from the muscle. So for example, in some of the clinical trials that may be upcoming in myotonic dystrophy, you may be asked to provide a muscle biopsy just a little piece of muscle to, to give the researchers a sense for is it doing what we think it's doing? And, and that's a burden to the patients who enter into these clinical trials, but it's important because it gives us the insights to say, should we keep going? Should we not keep going? Should we change the dose? And that's, that's what I think, I think we need to know. So better consortia of clinical sites. So what does that mean? That means academic centers that are really primed to do really good clinical trials. And Charles Thornton has been the pioneer in this, as well as in the science of myotonic dystrophy, but has established really a beautiful consortium where there's very good follow-up of myotonic dystrophy patients and the ability to do, we think, very good clinical trials. So that once we do get into the clinic, we think we know how to do it. 
you're going to go see one of those investigators, get evaluated, and we're very um, uh, optimistic about the data that we would get from uh, those clinical sites. So Biogen is now into this space, meaning neurodegenerative disorders or muscle disorders. We haven't been forever. Biogen has been around since 1978, um, but hasn't been in this space. We've really been a multiple sclerosis company. And the way we approached this is we decided back in about 2009 that these would be kind of the guiding principles, right? If you look on the bottom left, is there emerging science that says we should be in this disease? So do we understand the disease enough to try to develop a therapy? Is there an unmet need? In other words, is there, is there disability or, or suffering by a patient group um, that we want to fix? Because that's really what drives us. Does it fit with our core competencies, meaning we're not going to do everything. We're really only in the neurology space. Neurology, neuromuscular, muscle disorders, spinal cord disorders. So we have to have the core experience to be able to do this well, uh, and we do in this space. And development feasibility means can we do a clinical trial where we can find out whether a drug works. So those are the four pillars of why we're in this space. What you'll see is nowhere in there is, is it going to make money? And that's really important because what drives us is the patient population and whether we think we can make a difference. And I, I, I like that. Uh, and I've liked very much the approach that this company has taken as we've gone into myotonic dystrophy and ALS and spinal muscular atrophy. Just another slide on biomarkers. I'm not going to go into this, but there's a lot of ways in we, which we can do electrophysiologic measures, you know, the little needle testing that you get, or blood or muscle biopsies to really understand early in the course of a disease whether we're having an effect. And I think that's an important part. You'll see that in the clinical trials for those of you who participate. You'll feel poked and prodded and pin cushioned all over the place. And you're going to say, why do I have to do all of this stuff? And the reason is just that, so that we can figure out early whether it's having an effect and, and to not subject you to an ongoing clinical trial if the drug doesn't seem to be working. So it is drug development, therapy development. It is hard. It's long and expensive, and it usually fails. And we have to keep that in mind. But we think we understand why all of those things are the case. And we have ways to get around that so that we're more successful earlier in drug development. And I think that's, I think that's important. We do have new approaches. We've talked about some of them. Um, and really what drives us certainly is the obligation to patients. We want to maximize the time and effort that patients spend on trials of drugs that are likely to work. So, Last couple slides, we are beginning a natural history study in myotonic dystrophy. Charles is leading it. He will talk to you about it tomorrow. It is about to begin. This is not a drug trial in myotonic dystrophy, but it is a very important precursor to a drug trial in myotonic dystrophy. We're not quite ready for the drug because we haven't gone through all of the preclinical aspects that tell us that it's safe to go into humans. We're working toward that. But meanwhile, Charles has told us, and we agree, that we need to understand myotonic dystrophy better. And we need to understand how do we measure changes in myotonic dystrophy. So that's a natural history study that is uh, about to begin and it will measure uh, changes in um, muscle biopsy, things that we think are very important in myotonic dystrophy. It will allow us to standardize the methodologies for assessing myotonia and strength um, and, and other things as well. So that when we do get to the drug trial, we know how to do it really well and the quality of the data will be better. So this is, I think, a very important um, initiative. The primary objective is to look at the muscle biopsies uh, over a three-month period to develop those biomarkers so that we know whether it's working or not. Um, 
You'll see some of the details on this later, so I won't go into the details now, but that's just getting underway. And finally, you saw this. Tom Cooper gave a beautiful talk on antisense oligonucleotides from myotonic dystrophy. This is a, a biology that has been pioneered by uh, Isis Pharmaceuticals based on the beautiful science that was done out of his and other labs. So an antisense can alter what we think is a very important fundamental biology of myotonic dystrophy. You heard what it is. It's this little piece of DNA that may get into the muscle cells and alter um, the, the things that are happening in the muscle cells themselves. So we are planning to go forward in a clinical trial using an antisense oligonucleotide to stabilize or correct what we think is an important um, piece of myotonic dystrophy disease. We don't know exactly when. I'm not going to give you dates for when that begins. We're, we are going as quickly as possible, um, and we'll get there, but um, you want us to do the work in advance of that to look at the safety of this as fully as, as we intend to do. Now, D myotonic dystrophy is a multi-systemic disease. You know that. It, it in, involves not only the skeletal muscle, but the heart, um, the gastrointestinal tract, eye, even the central nervous system. So as we develop therapies for myotonic dystrophy, we really want to try to target all of them. Now, we probably won't be able to right off the bat. We're, we're going to take baby steps. And um, the, the muscle aspect is very important. The cardiac aspect is very important. We're looking into ways to, to affect all of it, but we just don't know. It's just too early. We will initially focus on the muscle aspects of the disease. We don't know. Maybe the cardiac and the GI aspects, which are very important in terms of the disability of myotonic dystrophy, may affect that as well. So I'll stop there. I won't go into the, 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 the design of the clinical trial. It's yet to be really fully developed, but we're excited about the program, and it, it's exciting to be in this community with you, and I hope we can move forward. So thank you. Uh, I believe we do have some time for questions. If you would please uh, write them down on the cards at your table. And uh, the staff from the foundation will pick them up and bring them up here. While you are doing that, uh, anybody who would like to uh, stand and ask a question, we'll go to plan for that. Sir. Molly is bringing you a microphone. So. I was just wondering, for some diseases, there's also a fast track process during the trials. Yeah, it's a good question. So the question is, there's a fast track process for many of these disorders. There are several mechanisms whereby you can get increased access to uh, the regulatory authorities like the FDA. There's another one called breakthrough designation. And a re these are really important in that they allow you increased dialogue with the FDA, and in some cases they speed up the development but more often, they actually will allow you to have a better clinical development program that's more likely to, do, to, to get an answer. Those are all available and should be used in myotonic dystrophy, there's no doubt about it. Uh, we have another question over here. If you have a card, if you would please be sure to raise it up so staff will see you pick it up. Hi. Sure. Uh, Myself and our three children have been involved in a longitudinal study at, at Rochester that's been going on for several years that seems to be similar to what you're suggesting will be needed before phase one testing starts. Uh, wonder if you might comment on that. And also, is there, I know in uh, oncology there's a fast track for getting drugs through the FDA. Is it possible that this myotonic dystrophy drug will will go on the fast track? Yeah, so to the first question, so um, uh, yeah, so, so Charles has done longitudinal studies and, and you've participated in them. Those have been incredibly important in getting us to where we are now. We need to keep going and we need to 
add some additional measures so that we're more confident when we go into the drug programs. But those have been uh, incredible studies and they have been really important and it really is a testament to the dedication of the patients to do that time and time again to go into these research studies. And it, it, it's helping the community to get to where we want to be, which is drug trials. The, the other one is the, the question that I answered before about the fast track. Yes, absolutely. We would very much try to get a fast track designation. I think the FDA would be very responsive to that. Bill. Hi, thank you, Dr. Kerr. Um, given the stage, I don't know if this is echoing, given the stage where we are right now with the research, um, how important is it for folks who are affected with this to do something and what are, is the most important thing or the top two or three important things? I would expect the registry may be one, but um, what is it that individuals can do to help advance this? Yeah, so that's a good question. So, you know, I think the registry is, is really important. Um, uh, it gives us a really good sense for what's happening in your lives and really what affects you, right? So we need to know that because what we want is the drug therapy to change things that matter to you, not to the regulators. We want, it, we want things that are affecting you. So this registry allows us to collect data to understand how we should develop our clinical trials. So please participate in that. The natural history studies are also very important. Charles will talk about that. Um, it's, it's going to be, I think, at five sites. And um, that contributes critical information to us. I would say those are the two most important things. And then keeping yourself as healthy as you can. I need glasses now. Uh, what registries are used to select appropriate patients for human studies? Well, registries aren't used to select um, for participation in clinical trials. In other words, if you go in and enter the information into the registry, we're not going to use that registry and give you a call and say, come sign up for this. It's to gather the information about what the clinical trial should do. You'll hear about the actual clinical trial itself. You'll hear it through through the Myotonic Dystrophy Foundation, certainly. They, the clinical trial itself will be published on multiple sites, including clinicaltrials.gov, uh, where you can find out about any clinical trial. And then what you really need to do is have a conversation with your physician about whether or not you would qualify for that clinical trial. Are you aware of studies on drugs for other conditions that are in the clinical phase uh, that have great overlap for DM? Well, um, no. No. I mean, there are similar disorders um, that are being, that for which therapies are being developed. We're doing this in spinal muscular atrophy. We're doing this in, in ALS and other disorders. But, but the specific therapy that we're talking about, this antisense oligonucleotide, is really purely specific for myotonic dystrophy. We can learn from other antisense oligonucleotides in other disorders, but only to a limited de degree. Are there any other countries that have done clinical trials with good results? Nope, not in myotonic dystrophy. Some clinical trials have been done, um, but, but nothing else out there is, um, is been shown to be effective. And similarly, are there other organizations that are doing research in this area? Well, there are lots of organizations that are doing research. You know, one of the things that the Myotonic Dystrophy Foundation is it really synthesizes all of that from various sources. So, so there are some advocacy groups um, overseas in Europe that, that have done some um, very good work. There are registries. Um, there are very good basic scientists. It's tough to kind of stay abreast of all of that. And the best way is really through the Myotonic Dystrophy Foundation where it can synthesize the work that has been done and really translate it to, OK, what does this mean? What are the implications of this? And how do I react to it? And uh, the last question I have, uh, why are they called orphan diseases? 
Why are they called orphan diseases? They, they don't have a parent. They don't have a huge group um, that owns them. It actually is a numerical, um, it's a number of patients below a certain threshold and it depends by region uh, whether it qualifies as orphan. Um, do you have a better answer for that? I think it refers to a group of diseases where a lot more research and work is needed. And you're absolutely right that it is, there is a kind of standard definition that's used uh, by the FDA and by other, by NIH as well. So it's a term that you will hear. It's not meant to be pejorative in any way, but it really refers to a place where the numbers of patients are relatively small, the kinds of issues that uh, Doug raised about getting drug companies interested in working in this space are, are operative. And so it really makes sense to group them together from a policy perspective, I think, and think about how you can stimulate work in that area. Well done. Can Jeremy. I just ask one question? I mean, the FDA is obviously a hugely important gating for the movement forwards on the drug front. What can we do as the patient community in terms of lobbying the the FDA uh, to basically clear the path so that when you get to the FDA with a drug, I mean, can we do that? Uh, what, what's your advice around that? You can do that. Um, a lot of a lot of patient groups do that. They they lobby on the Hill. They talk to senators. They talk to representatives. They talk to Janet Woodcock, who heads the FDA. Um, you know, I don't know how much effectiveness um, that has. I think the FDA really is a responsive partner and a flexible partner in developing therapies. I think, I'm not sure I would do it now. I think as we get toward and in the clinic, when we're trying to convince regulators that this is a meaningful change, that we're seeing and that this is important efficacy and that the, the patient advocacy groups and the patient populations want this, then it's different. I'm not sure I would do it now. I'm not sure that there would be any change in regulations or the FDA responsiveness. I see them as being very responsive now. I'm not sure if others agree. Do you agree? I would. <laughs> any other questions from the audience? Well. Erica's going to come up and tie up, and please join me in thanking Dr. Carroll. Thank you.